I was just thinking about this the other day, like how many fan bases going into this year really think they have a shot? I mean, think about that. I mean, the four was always like so hard. I mean, we just missed it in 19. So hard now. So many bases are, are going into fall camp. Just like the team might get there. I mean, that's good for the game. Welcome back or welcome to Why Option. I'm your host, Yogi Roth, fired up for today's episode because training camps have essentially begun. If you read our newsletter yesterday, we had a Q&A with Utah head coach Kyle Whittingham. The Utes opened up camp on Monday. A lot of schools are the reporting, starting practice. I'll be on a training camp tour beginning on Wednesday. We'll be going all across the country beginning at Washington with Jed Fish and then Dan Lanning and away we go. We'll be keeping you all up to date on all those things right here at whyoption.com. But today let's talk about the Utes. So with that, Jim Thornby, co-founder, executive producer, you ready for training camp? Yeah. I mean, I will be traveling around like yourself. I'll be pretty much stationed right here, uh, but <laughs> just bringing everything in and spitting it back to, to your way. But uh, yeah, I'm interested to, to kind of you know, we've kind of lived this realignment world uh, the last two years, for better or worse, uh, and now actually going to see how it all lays out on the actual football field. So kind of more excited to to turn the page on, on that part. Yeah, hey amen. Our newsletter over the weekend referenced that. It kind of probably wrote the longest one I, I may write in a while. We'll see how it goes, Jim. We'll see how the season goes. Just had a lot to get out on the plane uh, coming back from Indianapolis. Uh, fun fact, every flight I've been on from the Midwest back to the West Coast has been delayed so far this season. So two for two. Streak. It's a bad streak. <laughs> hey, it's good for the newsletter, though, because I just post up, I get a big cup of coffee, and away we go. Uh, but leaving media days and all the hype, which we, we've called kind of hype season, which is great, because who isn't hyped about your team? Every fan watching this or reading our newsletter, we thank you. Over 70,000 people. It's amazing. I uh, can't believe you keep doing it, keep showing up. But you're hyped about your team. And you should be, whether you're Purdue and you're picked 18th or you're Utah picked to be first, or you're Cal in this brand new league, or you're USC and you're trying to figure it out, or UCLA with a new head coach. I mean, you should be stoked about your program. And it was really fun, Jim, leaving Indy, thinking about that and then writing about it of every team does believe that their quarterback is their next savior. Every team does believe that the changes they've made on their respective staffs are the changes that were necessary to go get to the expanded college football playoff. And, and I think finally, before we turn to Utah, it, it was kind of what you alluded to. Like, there was a breath of fresh air, personally, of there, there wasn't chaos to be talked about. Like, I get the house and the case and all the legalese going on right now, uh, but there wasn't realignment necessarily, upheaval of a league or anticipation of a, of a media rights agreement. And I'll be honest, man, it just kind of felt nice to just talk about the players, learn about the teams. I got to meet a bunch of new head coaches. We went to one, two, three, four different media days. It was nice, wasn't it, just to talk about the team? Yeah. I mean, like, we can't even really begin to define how much of a cloud hanging over that was for us the last couple of years. I mean, that was that was not fun. And but this is fun, and this is why, again, this is why we do this because this is why we, yeah. this is the fun part. This is why you get into working at the sports to to the enjoyable uh, part of it. And, and Utah has, has always been. Uh, an enjoyable uh, part of that scene. Um, you know, uh, it's always funny when, you know, I look back at the early days of the Pac-12 network and like um, our digital team when you do all these online polls and stuff like that. And, like it got to the point where you couldn't put a Utah selection in the poll because it would win every time. Like the Utah fans <laughs> would just come on Twitter and come on every other social media platform and just dominate. And, and you've kind of seen the same thing uh as they've entered the Big 12, I, I feel like they've ruffled a lot of uh, Big 12 Twitter f uh, feathers uh, in that respect. Um, but, you know, they probably got the team to back that up this year. Yeah, yeah, they do. And I, and I love that for them. And and speaking directly to the Utah fans, we told you uh, when, you know, we began this thing that we weren't going to forget about the teams that maybe I'm not covering all year. And, Jim, I got to just call out this Utah fan base because they've been so amazing personally. Uh, I know you felt it when you've been on the road uh, for 12 years. This is a fan base that just totally leaned in. And for whatever reason, like I, I've struck up a beautiful relation with them. 
uh, in person, online, at games. I know fans by name when I go to a game and call a game. And I wanted to call Utah games moving forward. Like, that would have been a beautiful thing because going into rice Eccles Stadium is a magical environment. I'm going to sell out. It's all the people. Uh, that's not how it shook out in this cycle. But we told you we'd cover you. And we're going to keep talking about you. And we're going to be watching all the games. And away we go. So yesterday, on Monday of this week, uh, you saw a Q&A with Kyle Whittingham. And as Jim alluded to, uh, the sport has changed. And I loved his line. I want to re- make sure I don't screw the quote up. But he said, quote, we went from not being able to give a kid a ride to his dorm or a piece of pizza to giving him $100,000 in essence. And, and the sport has changed. And I do believe that the best head coaches radically accept change and adapt. Or they just don't fit. And I love how he has adapted and made sure Utah fits in this ecosystem of major college football. Let's just talk about Utah for a minute. Because I had a couple numbers, Jim, that I think you'll love because you because you love research. In the Pac-12, in the last five years, Utah has gone 42-18, and 18, which is second most in Pac-12 wins. Oregon was first with 48 wins. Uh, in their entirety in the Pac-12, they were fourth in the league in wins. Uh, and, of course, they had no coaching changes. I think when you look at them and this team this season, they returned 18 starters. It's CFP to me or bust if they stay healthy. I mean, they should – I don't want to say they're going to roll this league. Like, K-State's not easy. Arizona's not easy. Oklahoma State is not easy. I mean, they've got challenging games. But to think they're not going to be the favorite in any of those games, I think, would just be inaccurate. Uh, there's trap games. Thursday night, I think it's or the Friday night at Central Florida, Thanksgiving weekend. Like, who would have thought that'd ever be a conference game, Utah to Central Florida? But it is. But it's also a challenging game because there'll be a lot at stake for them in terms of going to not only the Big 12 title, but to the playoff. And let's remember the way this playoff is laid out coming off of Big 10 media days and SEC media days. Nobody's saying in the Big 12 or ACC are getting two teams in. So right now, to lock yourself in, you've got to go win the dang thing. And I think this has all the tools. Um, a couple other thoughts, Jim, that I think you'll like. Offensive line, they return four starters. Tight end, of course, they bring Kent, Brent Keithy back and company. They bring back their starting quarterback in camera rising. You saw the viral uh, commercial, all gas, no breaks. I don't know who started that first. It was Texas or Utah. That's up for debate. I know Sark pulled that puppy off a couple years ago. But overall, um, this team is loaded. So uh, with that, Jim, I want to take a beat before I, I hit you with something that I think you're really going to love. Ready, set, use French fries to go. Yeah, oil from French fries. Turn yesterday's leftovers into today's fuel. More power, lower emissions. 76 renewable diesel fuels all the ways you go, go, go. All right, so let's just talk about uh, veteran teams. I'm on this huge kick across the country that the teams that will win in the playoff will be experienced teams, right? Ohio State, 10 to 12 guys, depending who you ask chose to return to Ohio State instead of go to the NFL to make a bunch of money. We saw UW last year go to the national championship game with a variety of fifth and sixth year seniors. Michigan, same deal. A couple sixth year players for this group. Uh, Cam Rising, Makai Bernard, Brad Keithy, uh, Micah Pittman, among others. It's about 10 guys that have that type of experience. I look at the linebacking duo. This chance has to be, this team has a chance to be really special. I think it's 2018. It was Bradley and I and company. This is a freakish defense. Everybody drafted. I think that this defense has a shot to be that. You look at some of the additions offensively. That's the one thing Utah's always struggled with, in my opinion. Every year we'd go on our friend uh, Bill's show, right? ESPN 700, Bill Riley. We go on a show and he'd say, What's the question mark? And I feel like for 12 years it was the receiver. Well, now comes Dorian Singer. It came from your Arizona Wildcats. The USC struggled last year. Now he can be that true deep threat. Tayshaw Lyons, he comes in as well from UW, who was a pretty heralded uh, recruit, at least coming out of high school, among others. So they have some players, in my opinion, that can create some explosive capability because they need to. And now I want to go to my favorite part because this is the development part of Kai Whittingham that is just special. All these players that I'm going to reference have something in common, and Utah fans, you probably know what it is. But if not, get ready to uh, be enthused maybe. Junior Tafuna, who might be the best interior defensive lineman in the Big 12, if not one of the best in America, All-American candidate, another guy who decided to come on back, right? He had my father last season, decided to come on back for this run. Junior Tafuna, Devin Lloyd, Chase Hansen, Nate Orchard, came in as Nate Fakafahua. Let me get to my list here. Jonah Ellis and Paul Kruger. What's something they all had in common? Jim? What do you think? My guess, my guess, three stars. 
three and two or none. Paul Kruger wasn't even ranked. Devin Lloyd was a two-star recruit. Also, they all had position versatility, okay? Junior DeFuna came in as a defensive end, playing defensive tackle. Devin Lloyd came in as a safety. We know that story, moving closer to the line of scrimmage. Chase Hansen was a quarterback, <laughs> was a safety, then linebacker. Nate Orchard, linebacker, edge rusher. Jonah Ellis, linebacker, edge rusher, right? Like, I just say all that. And then I go to the position versatility, and this all matters. Makai Bernard, play corner. Remember that? We were at the Rose Bowl. Like, what is happening? How is he out there on the first snap of the game? Uh, Teo Johnson, playing the nickel position, I think, for them. I think he's going to be a pretty dynamic player. Was a wideout prior to the 2023 season. Uh, Devin Lloyd, as I referenced, was a receiver, punter, and safety in high school. But Conor O'Toole got a chance to be a true impact player for them. Was a wideout. Zamaya Vaughn, quarterback in high school. All of those things, to me, spell we can hang, we can handle we can navigate when the waters get muddied. Are you a veteran team? Do you just know your position or do you have versatility? Do you understand the capability of the defense and understand what the offense is doing? A linebacker, the phrase I'm stealing from our friend Rick Neuheisel, do you have running back eyes at linebacker? If you played running back in high school, you probably have an idea of where the running back is going to go. Like All of those things. Then you add in how well this team is coached. Oregon Scally, congrats to you. A little late, but he's going to be the next head coach at, at Utah. We all knew that when we were there in the spring. I'm uh, glad it finally came out to the rest of the public. Andy Ludwig is going to put them in great position offensively. And I'll end with this before we get to our conversation with our athletic director, Mark Harlan, brought to uh, brought to you by our founding partner, 76. I went, I've went. i been at, I don't know, 30 practices at Utah in 12 years, Jim. In the 90 minutes that I was there in the spring prior to calling their spring game, and I told this to Kyle Whittingham after practice, it was the most efficient and explosive offensive display I've ever seen at Utah. It, might, it was just a snapshot. I wasn't there for all 15 of them. Won't be there at all during training camp, but I'm just telling you, the Thursday prior to their spring game was the best I've ever seen them offensively, and they should be. They got Cameron Rising, who's played a boatload of snaps. He's seen every defense under the sun. We saw him at Big 12 Media Days. His confidence is through the roof. They've got Brant Keithy, who's out to prove something. This is a guy we thought he was gone to the league two years ago, hasn't played since that injury at Arizona State on the sideline when he hurts his knee. This is a driven team. They know there's something left on the table. I feel like that was them last year. They didn't have their stars. They didn't have their quarterback. They struggled. Look out. Look out. I just think about, like, especially with Cam, like that toughness that he brings. Because, I mean, I think, you know, in the last – Several seasons, maybe one of the more iconic plays of Utah football was in the in the Pac-12 championship game when Cam Rising running gets smacked. I mean, I mean, yeah. one of the, about as hard a hit as as you'll see, and then boom, he just gets right back up. Um, and I think that really speaks to him and to you know kind of the what he brings to a team and the whole image of that team. And I think him being back, I mean, I know it's kind of a uh, much simpler way to, of looking at it but him, him being back i think really uh if he can be anywhere around what he was prior to the prior to the injury is is really going to put them uh as a as a tough out in the big 12 which is you know a, a tough league because of the parity there i mean how even keel uh that conference is there's not that top five team in the country, at least in the preseason, that you're, people are going to look at and say, "Oh, yeah, that this this team's a top five team." Um, but there's so many good teams in the Big Twelve uh, that it, it's going to be a tough it's going to be a tough haul, and he's the t- a kind of tough person that can get them through that. Yeah, and let me be really blunt about it. Uh, how Utah's not in a top five? This really shocks me. Two years ago, when he's quarterback, it's the most explosive offense in the history of Utah football. Bar none. Look at the statistics. Look at the numbers. Number two, look at the players that they're returning. 18 starters, as I referenced. Four on the offensive front, and I think they have a very physical front seven. Lander Barton's got a chance to be all everything. All everything. Absolute game wrecker. He'll come off the edge. He'll play linebacker. He'll drop into coverage. He'll make plays. He'll impact the pocket. Like They have everything that you're looking for. And, and if we're going to go lazy narrative, which I'm happy to in this instance, if the Big 12 is traditionally offensive firepower not as good a defense at least even the Pac-12 was how is this team not even considered in that position as a top five team heading into the season we know physically they can hang with anybody 
they've they've proven that over the course of time. So I got no problem getting on the table for Utah. I don't think they're just a team that can win the Big 12. I think they're a team that can play against anybody in the country and take a run. Like imagine a playoff game at Rice Eccles. That'd be the only bummer if they win the league and they don't get a, a home playoff game because the nation wouldn't really get to hone in on that game. Now, I hope for Utah they get the bye, but I think they have a chance to win it all. Okay, with that, speaking of it all, Mark Harlan knows it all. He's been a great friend to us over the course of our time getting to know him. He's got a historic career in athletic administration. He understands sport and the lens of sport as well as anybody in the country. We went to Big 12 Media Days earlier this summer. Had a chance to catch up with Utah Athletics Director Mark Harlan, presented by our founding partner, 76. Take a listen. Thank you for taking the time for this endeavor. We're kicking it off. We got you here. Why option? Let's it. go. So good to see you, my friend. I know. So this was founded in the concepts of college football through the lens of the West Coast. You got an illustrious life on the West Coast. You think about college football out West, early memories, where you kind of net out? Sitting with my dad and my brother at the Coliseum at a UCLA home game. That's how aged I think I must be now. And and going to night games where apparently those were cool back then, just watching Wendell Tyler, John Shara. That's what was the whole love of, of, of college athletics for me. And then the move across to the to the Rose Bowl, Chancellor Young moving moving the team over. I just you know, and Dick Tomey is, you know, he's one of my mentors. He's no longer with us and, and going down a locker room and meeting those guys. It was just, you know, a magical thing for me uh, growing up as a kid. And, and so fast forward, you know, to be working in college athletics now at a big time West Coast school. It's, it's, it's quite a journey, but it all started sitting in the Coliseum. You know, a lot of people, even students at UCLA, when I worked at UCLA, didn't know they used to play at home in the Coliseum. It's kind of crazy, but I remember it vividly. How do you think those memories shape you now? Are you running a multi-million dollar organization in Utah athletic department? You're transitioning to a new league. I mean, there's, there's every day there's a new breaking news in college football. In this case, gets whatever. Uh, but but how do you think that that allowed you to navigate the waters that you're in now? Well, just you know, I feel like I'm getting a little older in the business. I'm going to be 30 years coming up. I don't think I've seen it all, but I've seen a lot. So I feel like when these things come, and the, you're right, not a week that goes by that I can't think of recently, you're like, wait, what just happened? I mean, most recently, I remember driving from a meeting and turning on the radio, and Bill Riley was doing a show. I was like, oh, breaking news, unlimited transfers. I'm like, wait, what didn't you say? <laughs> like, did that really happen? And okay, that's different. You know, so so you just you just kind of go back to your leadership structure and style and and uh, don't see him, you know, don't, don't, let, don't let people see a sweat. Um, as Brett said earlier, pressure is for those that are, uh, you know, are, are joyful to be in these jobs. And I think that you think about all of that and you apply those principles to them. And the other thing, Yogi, I think that's really been helpful for me is what hasn't changed. And what hasn't changed is these 17 year olds just went through a huge cycle of meeting with recruits for football during the June period, parents that are nervous. These kids are going to get paid. Who cares? They're still nervous. They're still in the office of the AD trying to ask questions. And I love it. And that's grounding. And, you know, we got our 90% graduation rate plus. Um, and how do we keep that? Like, that's challenging. How do we keep doing that? And, and that's the kind of stuff that gets you pretty fired up and excited. I consider you one of the guardians of the game. And, and, and all sports, for sure, but specific to football. Uh, and I think it's important to have guardians of the game because – it's easy to get lost in the news, the politics, the business of the game and forget like 120 by 53 and a third. So, so for you, like, how do you, how do you do that? And how do you feel like, like, do you agree? Like you have that role? Well, I, I've been so fortunate. You know, I spent three years on the football oversight committee, which was a fascinating journey um, there through COVID. And so that was interesting. Uh, to try to put all that back together again. And then I was able to, to, you know, share a subcommittee that really looked at practice, spring football, the calendar. You know, we made some good changes. And I think it showed that you can change this game and make it better. Like, let's not just sit back and not lean in on these things. Technology now, we're going to see all that on the sideline now, which is we should be doing. At this very stadium, you know, we we, we, got, we were one of the, the teams that experimented with, with you know, headsets, you know, in, in the, in the thing. And, and Morgan Scully didn't know who to give it to. So we gave it to four guys and we were running all over the place. We 
made that adjustment. I still get more good grief about that. But I mean, these are things that help the game. Um, you know, being on the CFP this last year was fascinating to, to watch that process, time and energy that people put in on that to create the best platform. Another great change with the 12 team. I was just thinking about this the other day, like how many fan bases going into this year really think they have a shot? I mean, think about that. I mean, the four was always like so hard. I mean, we just missed it in 19. So hard now. So many bases are, are going into fall camps. Like the team might get there. I mean, that's good for the game. Need a little bit more structure off the field. We, we got to get some life back to our coaches. Um, I'm, I'm worried about them. My friends that coach in the NFL take these six weeks off. Now their season's a grind. I mean, it's no easy deal, but man, to see them take that time off, I'm worried about that. We got to keep our best young coaches coming up in college. You know? So I'm passionate about that subject. I'm, I'm working hard on that. So anyway, there's a lot of stuff ahead, but man, it's so popular right now. It's so awesome. Yeah, it, it's really, it's amazing. Like calling games, is, is the greatest gift profession I've ever had. And it felt like I called a, a mutual friend of ours after the season last year, the, after the games ended. And I said, God, that was so fun. But 24 hours later, I was like, God, it just feels like a weird sport right now. Like, it's kind of dark. Like, all the stuff kind of, all the mud came up. And and I feel like in the NFL, like, there's structure around agency. There's structure around calendar, to your point. And I'm worried about the game. And what I keep hearing from people is that, yeah, well nothing's going to change or college football can't change or the NCAA won't change. And here you are saying like change is possible. I think that's a very hopeful phrase. For well, those well there is. And there has been change. It just, you know, sometimes it just, you know, it's kind of like Shawshank redemption, man. You got to keep, you got to keep pitching in that wall, put up those movie posters. Um, <laughs> but we got to do more. We got to, I really like how football oversight has kind of reformed itself and is, is, I'll just be candid. There was, there was a moment in my first year of football oversight where we do this work and it gets seen in civil aid council and then it gets voted down. We're like, why are we all coming to Indianapolis if the bigger body is, is... So that's kind of changed now. And so there's a lot of incredible thought um, on a lot of different things. The calendar is the next big thing. We've got to figure this out. You know, I was supported the June early signing day. It didn't pass. I think it didn't pass for a good reason, you know, because I think a lot of high school coaches are really concerned about that. We got to work on that. We have to educate more about why I think that's helpful for both. I mean, I think if you have a high school senior that signs with you, maybe they can just focus on their senior year. They might think that no, once they sign, they don't really want to play. I, I, I get, I get a lot of that, but we got to continue to dialogue about that stuff and just overall structure. You know, roster management. I think kids deserve the right to go where they want to go, but that's challenging. You know, and uh, you know the the twelve team playoff. How will that affect bowl games? That's the stuff we got to really keep an eye on. Um, we were in the Las Vegas Bowl last year. We didn't play well. We didn't win. We had a great week there. It was so fun. The guys had a blast. And uh, that stuff's important too. Um, it was a couple years ago. I remember being right here. Utah, U.S. Standing in the end zone. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And as the game ended, I'm walking one way. You're walking the other. We lock eyes and you say, culture wins. That was your quote. Uh, we've talked to Kyle Whittingham numerous times as well as on this podcast um, recently. Culture is is a phrase thrown around all the time. But you have one that has sustained 20 years with this head coach. You just named a guy who was playing 20 years ago to be the next head coach. Like, What, what do you observe tangibly from a culture standpoint? And then why Morgan and given the title? Yeah, remarkable. It's It really is something that that I'll always treasure that I got to see. I was so excited about coming here for a lot of reasons. Like I was at UCLA when Utah got the invite, but as a part of that, you know, UCLA and USC were going to have a big voice in that. So I was asked to really, by Mr. Guerrero, to really dive into Utah. And the moment you do, you start studying wit. Um, well, first you go back to McBride and, and Coach McBride, what he did, and then Urban comes in and does what he does, and then wit. It's been remarkable, this transition of leadership and, and different leaders. Right. Incredible run. I like to think of the Utah football culture. It's not for everybody. It's not. Um, but for the ones that, that they recruit in, it's like perfect for them. You know, the work, um, you, you know, the volunteer conditioning, is, the guys are all out there. There's always these leaders every year. I remember the year that Devin was a rising senior. He'd be kind of quiet. He really deferred to other leaders on the team at the time. Bradley and I and all those other stuff. But then when it was Devin's time, he was so ready. And on this very field, you know, that interception against Oregon, I think actually st sitting right here where he crossed the goal line, ironically. I mean, game-changing for the program, but not unexpected because Devin was ready for that moment. 
And again, yeah, you're right. The SC game, um, we're down 17 to three and just, you just kind of knew, like we just figured out, you know, Morgan made some adjustments on defense and then we just took over. But, um, yeah, it's just, and they graduate like during this run, like we're over 90%. Like we've moved our grad rate in the football program They hold each other accountable. Uh, they do the work. It's, um, you know, I don't know if we'll see it again. It's interesting talking to coach Gundy, you know, the two of them are just like a little different, you know, unicorns walking around the field here. You know? <laughs> um, I didn't realize till Witt said that they started within two weeks of each other, which is just wow. incredible. And that, and that's who we open with in the, in the big 12 in Stillwater. But yeah, he's, it's just an amazing, um, great experience for the students to go through. The parents are just so appreciative. It's, it's just, it's awesome. Yeah. I believe it. Uh, before we cut you loose here, uh, I can remember when I was coaching at SC and Steve Sarkeesian had an offer to go to the Raiders. And, and I don't think I've ever showed this, but uh, he, he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. And he goes downstairs, and there's a we had like an old dry sauna in the locker room. And he goes in there, and him and Coach Carroll have a conversation, and they're like, hey, we can give you a new deal. And at the time, like nobody was making big, big money, right? Get a new deal, and we can get you the coach in waiting. But it was never public. Because yeah. it's private school, it didn't have to do any of that. Sure. Um, but that was kind of the era that coaching waiting started happening, and then I feel like it just dropped off, and nobody did that anymore. Yeah. You guys just announced that with Morgan Scally, a lot. I mean, lifelong Utah Utes. Uh, what went what went into that? Yeah. And and can you tell me? Yeah, absolutely. It was a journey, right? You know, I got here, and I I was so impressed by Morgan. There's just an energy around him, an aura that you know you find yourself around folks at times, and got to know him personally incredible dad incredible husband and you know just a fun guy to be around i mean just just electric really you know enthusiasm on the field etc recruiting unbelievable I'd, I'd done a trip to houston i ran into a guy hey you got the best recruiter in the back row in houston i'm like okay and uh so we we were you know we were there with that and then of course we had the incident um you know with with a very significant racial text that he had sent about 12 years ago and right before COVID and, and, and we hit him hard because it was not a good thing. And, and, you know, it was one of those deals where I expected a lot of him after that happened, but I had no idea how well he would respond. And he just dove into the learning, the journey, you know, how does, how do, how do you learn more? So nothing like that ever happens again. And you learn, learn about yourself, but also how do you manage a crisis? And so it was a, it was a really challenging year plus for him, um, on that. I think it was this last summer when, you know, um, I had known all the work he had done and just also just continued to do as a coach. I just said, you know, it's time. It's time to time to do this. You know, the transfer world, everything going on, you know, let's let's do this. And we got that done near the end of the season. And of course, just announced it this last week. And, and I'm so excited for the University of Utah because it gives us an opportunity. I think the best opportunity, obviously, to continue with this culture. But Morgan will have his spin now. He, he will absolutely do things different. Um, I'm convinced of that, but with the depth and breadth of what he's learned from coach McBride, coach Meyer, I mean, he spans all three and of course wit. So what a great thing for, for Utah, but I'm really proud of Morgan too, because uh, he's earned and deserved this. And we're really blessed in this era of, of a lot of changes. That one just felt right. Well, it feels right to have you on this show. Yeah. I appreciate it. Is it launch? Uh, for us, so awesome. it's, it's kind of an early start for us. Yeah, let me just brag about you for a minute. Your enthusiasm is also affection, and your care of the game, um, storytelling uh, that you've told in schools that I've been to, and what you did for the league for so many years. No one did more homework than you. So fired up about the new venture. I'll be listening on my little run slash walks, more running than walk. Um, but uh, excited for what's ahead for you as well. Thank you. We're gonna miss you on Saturdays. We've we'll tracking every game. We'll be covering you guys for sure. as well as yeah. well. But I got a feeling like it's just a it's just a little bit of a break. I'll be back at Rice Eccles, <laughs> calling some games, hanging out with you guys. Hey, and the Utes will appear at a few of these stadiums that you might be. Yeah, at. that's what I'm talking about. You never know. Yeah, hey, I'm hoping. I'm, I'm all in on that. Appreciate it. It's the Afterglow. Jim Thornby, Yogi Roth post an interview with Mark Carlin at Big Twelve Media Days in Las Vegas at Allegiant Stadium. A uh, huge fan of him. The Afterglow is always a time where Jim and I get to talk about the person we just interviewed, but also some questions we wish we asked, some lessons learned. So, Jim, I'll allow you to go first, man. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, always, like, anytime we talk to anybody that has a Dick Tommy connection, like, right away, we're <laughs> right there, it's a home run. You know, Dick, Dick Tommy, you know, um, was Arizona's head coach when I was a student, 
many many moons ago but um one of the one of the all-time great human beings uh but with with mark you know i've gotten the chance uh to work with him um the last couple of years in a couple of different you know different varieties um being on the conference side uh not only as the, as the football communication rep but also the baseball communications rep so he was you know he was on the baseball committee last year so um you know having not having to getting to uh work on all those reports uh with him so that uh he and uh the Oregon baseball coach were both ready for everything that was kind of coming their way for those those committee meetings um you know he just he's a really prepared guy um and it, and but also just an easy person to work with especially with someone when you know you're he's in Salt Lake and I'm here in the Bay Area you know and I'm just kind of breaking up reports here and there you know not not a lot of crossover because of the demands on both of our jobs but like when you have that little bit of crossover it's like boom 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 everything works just seamlessly yeah to me what's always has stood out is his thoughtfulness and then the the depth and breadth he can go you know if, if we all could you know you get asked this all the time when you do interviews of if you could change one thing in college football what would it be and you know i've got a couple things in the rules side that i might adjust but i wouldn't add out that there needs to be a commissioner a governing body and if we were voting on who could run that, who should run that, Mark Harmon should be at the very top of that list. I mean, really, he's he's sought out as an athletic director across the country. He loves the job that he's currently at and thriving at. Look look what Utah has gone through, what he's guided them through over the course of time. It's just been steady. And I think in the up and down volatile world of college athletics, like being steady is a trait that I don't think people really love up enough. And I think he's been that. I think he's a great fit in that community. He loves living there with his family. Uh, and I just love his impact on the game. You know, it's, I, I've been in a bunch of meetings with him like yourself where you just see the leadership traits stand out. I think if you heard that interview and enjoyed it as a Utah fan or just a fan of college athletics, you can tell his leadership traits are through the roof. He's a visionary, always looking through sometimes the muddiest muddiness of collegiate athletics, especially around football, around this realignment thing. And I just go back to him being so thoughtful. And, and I love what he said, even uh, just being a supporter of what we're doing here. Uh, you know, kind of off and running. We're what three weeks in or so, Jim. Uh, and, and it was cool to kind of sit down with him at Media Days, among others. We got a couple really fun other interviews coming your way. Brett Brennan, head coach at your alma mater, also a Dick Tomey protege. So it's the Dick Tomey theme here for a couple of weeks. It sounds and, like. anyway, I can leave it in that we're that, that's that's <laughs> we're going to do it. So I love it. All right. Well, big love to our founding partner, Seventy Six, in support of all of our interviews. That one. Of course, is Mark Harlan from University of Utah. For all Utah fans, if you missed the newsletter that came out on Monday of this week, go check it out at whyoption.com. It's a Q&A with Kyle Whittingham. I love what he said about the sport, where it's going, and really how he transformed the most. I think uh, it might not surprise you, but I think you'll re- really uh, you'll be endeared to it. I, I know I was. Uh, he and I have talked about that over the course of the year, uh, the last couple of years, his relationship with athletes, now that has changed and adjusted, and how he continues to adjust. Now we're all going to adjust as we watch Utah play in this new league that's full of random logos. But I think of all, among all of them, Utah is going to be one at the end that will stand out, continue to elevate. So all of you listening and watching at yoption.com, lots of love. Thank you for the support. Spread the word. And Utah fans, we're going to keep coming. You got us all season long. Peace. Peace.